Yes. Welcome to my um, talk about container live migration. Uh, my name is Adrian Rebo. I work at Red Hat. Um, I'm involved in process migration, which is the basis for container migration since uh, for the last 10 years at least. This is all based on CRIU, which I will um, give an introduction about here. And I'm working on CRIU since 2012 at least and I'm focusing on container migration since 2015. Everything I'm talking about here has been already written down in an article, um, can be found here. And I want to start with the definition what I think or what I do when I say uh, container life migration because um, it's something people often ask me um, about the details. So it, it basically, it's the idea of transferring a running container from one system to another. You could also say stateful migration, so the process just continues to run at the same point in time. You stopped it um, before the migration, and um, this the, the basic concept is I serialize the process or the whole container on my source system somehow. Then I transfer it to the destination system and then I just restore it, restart it, and the container keeps on running at the same point in time. I started the migration of the whole thing. Um, as already mentioned, this is all based on, on CRIU, checkpoint, restore in, in user space. And um, there are multiple integrations of checkpoint, restore, user space in different um, Container runtimes, I will uh, give an overview later which container runtime has CRIU support right now. And the, the main uh, things I will demo will all be, uh, be Portman based. Um, so this is about integration of CRIU and Portman and how to use it to live migrate containers. So I want to give you some details about, about CRIU works, uh, how CRIU works. So the first step you have to do, you have to checkpoint your processes. So you have um, a container and you have multiple processes running inside it and you tell CRIU, I want to checkpoint this container. You point it or you give it the PID of the first process in the container and it will just stop and collect the information of all processes in the process tree. So all child processes are always checkpointed um, with your, uh, with the first process. And Creo does this, um, or one possible way how Creo does this is using ptrace to stop the process. There's also the way to using the, the C group freezer to stop the processes. And so Creo stops the processes, collects all the information and writes it to disk. And so the tool is named CRIU, uh, is named Checkpoint Restore in User Space, and there's a reason for the name, because um, before Checkpoint Restore in User Space um, was developed, there were multiple other Checkpoint Restore implementations for Linux there, and they were not in User Space. They were either completely in kernel space, or they were even more in User Space with um, um, syscall, uh, in, uh, in, uh, this is called uh, something, <laughs> something. <laughs> so, whatever. So, um, CRIU, CRIU works a different way. Um, CRIU tries to use existing um, kernel interfaces as much as possible. So, there's basically not one um, kernel interface added uh, by CRIU, which is only useful for checkpoint restore. The interfaces CRIU added to the kernel are most of the time to get more information about the running process from the kernel. Um, so other, there are also, for, for a lot of the things CRIU added, there are other use cases which are using this new information which CRIU added since 2012. And once CRIU collected all the information from the PROC file system, then there's the next step, which is called the parasite code. Um, this is probably my most favorite part of CRIU because it's, it's also the craziest if you go into the details because it's, you, you wouldn't expect something like this when you start uh, looking at a project uh, like, I don't know, I, I wouldn't expect it at all, somebody doing something like this. 
So the parasite code is injected into the running process. So the process has been um, stopped, paused using ptrace, and now um, Creu extracts some code out of the process using ptrace and replaces this code with a parasite code. Now that the parasite code is in there, Creu restarts the process at the point of the parasite code. The parasite code is running inside of the address space of the processes it wants to dump, and so. And it's running a kind of a daemon, so um, the parasite code connects to the main Creo process, and the Creo process can um, send commands there to the process to do things from within the address space of the running process. And one of the main or one of the biggest things which are happening from inside of the from the parasite code is dumping the memory from the process to disk, so that it can be later be restored and the same memory information is there as before checkpointing. And although ptrace offers a way to, um, um, to extract a memory from the process, um, out of the process, um, this, is, this, this used to be slow at the point um, where the parasite code uh, was written. And if you're looking at um, uh, migration times, the, the, the dumping of the memory is, is really fast because most of the time for your migration will always be spent by the transfer, by the network transfer to transfer the checkpoint image from one system to another. So the parasite code is used to write all this information to disks and to disk and once um, the parasite code is done, it's removed from the process. Creo calls this now curing the process. The original code is restored or the parasite code is removed and the original code which was there will be copied back so that if you want to uh, continue to run your process, it will just run without ever knowing that it was under the control of the parasite code. And at this point, uh, the checkpointing is, is basically finished. All the information has been written to disk. And in, in the case of, um, of a migration, you would probably kill your target process so that it stopped. But it also can continue to run. This is um, whatever you feel like is the best for your use case. Um, what's also interesting about uh, container life migration is if you're running with Podman, you're probably running on a system with SE Linux. And SE Linux and Creo is especially interesting. I gave a talk at the Linux Security Summit about this because Creo does things which the SE Linux policy is not really happy about. So you have to invest some additional time to let Creo do the right things if it's running under SE Linux control. But um, this is just too much for today here for my time. And so the, once the checkpointing is finished, you come to the second step, that's, that's the restoring of the process. And um, so first what Creo does, it reads all the checkpoint images to see um, what, what is there. And then um, Creo basically creates a process for each process which used to be in the process tree and for each thread which used to be there. And there was a talk at, at Linux Plumbers conference I gave about Creo and the PID dance because um, creating a process used to be complicated on, on Linux. So you had to, um, you, there was an interface and you had to write uh, the PID you want to the interface and, do, and then be really fast with the fork and hope that no other process is created in, during the same time. But with, uh, we, uh, with the help of Christian, we introduced Clone 3, and uh, now we can create a process with a certain PID. This is um, available since, I guess, since Monday, Linux 5.5. .5. And Creo also has all the code to use Clone 3 if your kernel has it. So now Creo can uh, create new processes with less syscalls and without any races that some other process might have been created in between. And once all these processes have been created, um, those processes are now morphed into the process which should be restored. And then uh, I like the position, um, the example about uh, file descriptors. So, um, Creo just, so what Creo does during checkpointing, it tries to figure out all the file descriptors and to which file they point and which position they are. And this writes, and Creo writes that to the checkpoint images. And once the process is restored, 
the file is opened with the same file descriptor, it's seeked to the same position, and once the process keeps on running, the file descriptor is in exact the same situation it used to be before checkpointing. And so that's basically what Creo does with all the other resources the process is using. All the memory uh, pages are mapped back to the place where they used to be before um, checkpointing. Um, we are loading all the security settings, AppArmor, SE Linux, and SecCom. We're doing this as late as possible, as mentioned, to do not have those policies interfere with Creo's changing of the process or restoring of the process. And once the process has um, been set up in all the ways that it has to be, we are jumping back in the original code and the code and the processes can continue to run at the same point in time where we checkpointed them before. So um, that's where the process restore is finished basically. And so now to um, container live migration to the actual um, inclusion of um, Creo into different pro projects. I think the first one I have to mention here is OpenVZ because um, they invented Creo for their container use case to be able to live migrate um, their containers from one system to another. I never used it myself, but that's the group who invented Creo. Then one interesting um, user of uh, Creo is, is it's Google, which we were informed like one and a half years ago. And so Google actually uses on, in their container runtime Borg, um, Creo to live migrate processes in production a lot. And as far as we upstream Creo know it, they are very happy with uh, what, how it works and it works reliably for them. So this is something which we're uh, pretty happy about as upstream. And uh, Lexc, Lexd has a long integration of um, Creo for a very long time already. Then there's an um, integration of Creo in, in Docker. It's, uh, you have to enable the experimental mode to, to use it. And at this point in time, I would say it's, it's basically unmaintained. So I'm not sure how good it works right now. And then the thing I've been working on the last two years is the integration of Creo, Creo into Podman. Um, we have seen a talk about Podman in the morning already. It's a container engine runtime which is daemonless and rootless. And, um, and I started to work on this uh, beginning of 2018. And first code was merged in May, uh, was <coughs> written in May and merged in, in October 2018. This was only the checkpoint restore implementation, so you could checkpoint your container, reboot your system, restore your container, and it would continue to run at the same point you have checkpointed it. And then I continued, oh, and, and this required changes in all the levels uh, of Podman, RunC, Conmon, and also Creo um, for how uh, Podman handles network namespaces. And then after that, I continued to work on the container live migration for Podman. This was merged in 2019 last year. This um, already all also required um, changes on all the levels of um, which were which are involved. Also, the SE Linux changes were part of this. And with this, I'm already at my at my demo. I copied the commands from my demo here on the slides. Um, but let's run them here. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm running a, a, a um, I'm running a container with a Wildfly container. I have a stateful application there, so that container migration is, is at least somehow useful. Um, so let's start a container here. Um, the Wildfly container is, is a nice use case um, because it actually takes some time to start because all the Java things need to be loaded. And, and actually restoring it from the checkpoint is much faster, like 50% faster than um, using it, um, than starting the container fresh. So now I can access um, my, my Java container. So I have the simplest uh, application which just returns an integer and every time I read it, it's increased by one. So I'm using curl to access um, the IP address from the container and my application is called hello world. And the first result is zero and the second result is one. So it's, it's simple, but it's stateful. 
Now I'm telling Podman to um, checkpoint the container. I'm using the, the flag minus R. This tells Podman to keep the container running. So I'm making a checkpoint of my container while it keeps on running. So now um, Podman is um, telling Preview to make the checkpoint. The checkpoint has been written to disk. And now I'm accessing my container again. And now it should say two and three. And so the container keeps on running while I made the checkpoint. Now I'm transferring the, um, the, uh, con the checkpoint archive. The archive includes all the files about the running processes, all the memory pages which have been dumped, and all the changes which have been made to the file system of the container. So this includes all file system changes and all process state which I'm now transferring to another VM on my system. And now I'm telling Podman on the other system to restore the container. And this takes about four seconds usually, something like this. Now the container is restored. And now I can access the container using curl again. And now I'm getting back the two which I got back there on top, which is the same value before checkpointing the container. So I checkpointed the container. It probably change each, each state, but I can continue the container from the same state um, it used to be before checkpointing. That's my demo, and with that, I'm already done. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, it's cool technology. Um, have you, you mentioned that a year and a half ago Google integrated this into Borg. My understanding about Kubernetes is stuff's supposed to flow from Borg into Kubernetes, at least theoretically. Have you heard any noise about uh, people being interested in Checkpoint Restore in Kubernetes? Uh, no, personally I haven't heard anything of that, but that's... So basically this was integrating it into Podman is my first step into getting it somehow into K Kubernetes. So now I have to somehow get it into, I don't know, cryo and, or something like this, and, and then maybe Kubernetes. But that Google uses it internally might make the discussion about the usefulness of container life migration to Kubernetes maybe a bit easier, because that's probably one of the problems that containers are stateless. Why won't you, why do you have to life migrate them? But, but besides that, it might make it be easier to get it into Kubernetes as well, yes. Hi, uh, you talked about uh, file descriptors being copied over. Uh, can you talk more about sockets being copied over, like how, it's, how it works behind the back? So uh, this is probably the question about TCP sockets, something like this. So. Um, Kriu can checkpoint and restore um, network sockets. So if you have a working TCP connection, it will still work on the destination host. The only thing you have to do, the restored process have to have access to the same IP address because without the same IP address, you cannot uh, restore a TCP connection. And for UDP, it doesn't matter. It's just, it just works. Um, and for TCP, you have to have the same IP address. Other questions? Okay. Oh, yeah, there's another one. Uh, databases. Could you please tell us more about how it's good with databases? Of course, we had this experience before, and databases, the thing like they, they usually need to be stateful, and uh, that was a problem for us to handle migration of, of active databases, actually. So how is the progress right now with this? Thank you. So um, databases. So I guess this basically depends on how your database is outlaid in your in your container. If your all your database files are mounted into con the container, then it's probably you migrate your container and you have to migrate your data directory and then restore it. This should work. Um, there are many years ago we tried to migrate um, Oracle databases. And this worked, but the database shut down itself after the migration. 
And we think um, that this is because the time is different on the different hosts. So with the time namespace, which was just accepted this week, um, and once it makes its way to Creo, this could be solved in a way that we can tell the process in the container that your time actually hasn't changed. You're still running on the same clock monotonic as before or something like this. So there's the work on the time namespace is probably the most important for, for the database, I would guess. But yeah. Thank you.